One of the many traditions over Easter is the Easter egg hunt. Self-disciplined adults take time to hide Easter eggs around homes. They hope the Easter eggs will be found by children rather than remaining undiscovered for weeks while the autumn sun, which still packs enough punch to turn chocolate eggs into molten messes um, as they seep out of fading foil wrappers. For many of us, regardless of our age, we engage in our own search, don't we? We search um, and search, and this search can go on for weeks, months, or even years. And for some, just when life starts to settle down into a norm, we can find that what we have found can be challenged by a midlife crisis. But what motivates your search and where do you go to for the answers that can radically shape the life and where you land in your search? It shapes not only you, but your family and how you interact with the world around you. Let me pray. Jesus, as we spend time in your word today, as we reflect on the things and the truths that you have before us, Lord, we ask that you would continue to speak to us, that you would enliven in us and and, um, encourage us in our desire to search for the truths in your word and the truths that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2018, R asked the question in an online forum. I've been asking myself, what is the point of living anymore? What's the point of getting out of bed? I've skipped appointments, meals, just daily things, because I don't see a point of anything anymore. I am confused and been struggling with my identity as a person and in the society now live in. I'm lost. I can't see much ahead of me right now. All I can see is is tears. So here I am reaching out. Please help me. What's the point is a question which many search to answer. Around the world, there are people and um, organisations out there seeking the answer to what is the point? In an article in um, Psychology Today, one writer suggests that there is no point to life. Life is the point. And if you can follow his thinking, Timothy Carey suggests that we have no objective irrefutable, immutable point that drives us all except, perhaps, the point of keeping our worlds in the states we are satisfied with. In a similar thought, D. Marquis suggests that if there's one thing that holds true for most of us is that the point of life is to live the exper- and experience things to the fullest, whatever that fullest means for you right now. Or as the philosopher Sheryl Crow puts it, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. The challenge is that for for individuals, organisations and even churches, if we don't know or understand what the point is, then will we um, ever find that we get to the point? And as a church family, we have been revisiting our point of existence And this can be a scary question to ask because if we don't know or understand our point and keep that in focus, then our existence becomes, dare I say, pointless. And we find ourselves like R, lacking in vision, focus or even a reason to exist. 
So over the last several years as a church, we've been revisiting what does it mean uh, for Northern? What does God want Northern to be here for? And if, if so, if God wants us to be here, then why? What's the purpose? What's the point of Northern's existence? And while some of us answer, um, for some of us as a church, as we answer this, um, we, we may find that this lands well for us as a church family. For those that are listening later or from other parts of the world, whether it's in the States or um, in the UK or in other parts of Australia, hopefully there's still enough of a, a, a connection here for you and that there are some universal truths here for all Christians. For Northern and for us as a leadership group, we believe that God has a mission for us that we are still pursuing. As spirit-led followers of Jesus, we are called to live life well through outworking the transformative power of the good news. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called not just to plod along and just see what comes of any given day, being tossed and turned by fads and fashions, by political persuasions or by financial security. We are called to take risks, to step out in faith and to be disciplined in our decisions and in the pursuits that God has for us. Whether we are 16 or 86, we believe that we are called to live life well through the outworking of the transformative power of the good news that is manifest and realised in and through our lives. We, are, we believe that we are also called to help those to whom God sends us. We are called to help those um, that um, God brings across our path, to help others to live their life well. And we believe that the best life possible, a life lived well, is a life that is in a personal relationship with Jesus the Christ. But in this, even in this, there are choices that we make about what we are committed to. You know, one of the challenges that we face today is the challenge of choice. Either we want to do everything or alternatively, we, we put our choices on hold, uh, making, making it uh, a choice and waiting for that choice to be made to the very last moment. We fear that if we choose too early, then we might miss out. And the fear of missing out can have us settling for less. As a church, we believe that if we're going to live life well, then we need to be committed to the right things. This means that in some things we will say yes to those and to others we're going to say no. This means that we might even say no to some good things in order to be committed to the best things. As a church, as a church family, we are committed to being transformed by the Spirit of God as we follow Jesus. We believe that at the core of living life well is a personal saving faith with Jesus. This decision is more important than who you marry, where your kids go to school, what um, you pursue as a career, what sport you play, and even, dare I say it, what football team you follow. The single most important decision that we can make, the single most important decision that we can ever encourage anyone else to make, as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, as friends or work colleagues, is the decision to be a follower of Jesus. As Jesus put it in, and is recorded in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 37, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, Jesus said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your way, give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, 
you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? This is not a message that we beat others up with, but it's a choice that we commit to and that we lovingly encourage others to commit to as well. We don't follow a pastor. We don't follow a creed or a set of doctrines. We follow a person. We follow Jesus, who we believe is the Son of God, who took on flesh and blood. Jesus, who modelled to us how to live out the values of the kingdom of God and then took on um, our selfishness and our sins and died on the cross and rose victorious, never to die again. We follow Jesus, who um, will come and will be with us in the age to come for all eternity. And so, as Jesus says, and for the sake of this life and for all eternity, the most important thing that we can do is is to accept Jesus as the leader of our life and to follow him. Our commitment to following Jesus means that we are faced with the choice, that when we are faced with the choice to do one thing or another, we seek to follow Jesus' lead in our life. Our hope is that we model to others our preparedness to seek Jesus' leading in the decisions that we make as well. This is not just the role of the pastor, but for every follower of Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus means at a fundamental level, we look to Jesus to lead us. Not just in the model that he provided some 2,000 years ago, but in how Jesus would want us to live today. Jesus didn't abandon us or leave us with some sacred writings to memorise, as helpful as that is. He didn't just leave us with that. But Jesus left us the Spirit of God, not an external force that hopefully nudges us in the right direction when we need it, but the Spirit of God, the advocate that takes up residence in the follower of Jesus' life. As John reminds us in chapters 14 and 16, in John 14, verses 15 to 18, he says this, If you love me, obey me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognise him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. John goes on to record Jesus in chapter 16, verses 13 to 15, where Jesus says this, When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. The Spirit of God guides us into all truth as we seek to follow Jesus because the Spirit brings us the message of Jesus. The Spirit of God empowers and enables us in our following of Jesus to do all that Jesus calls us to do. In Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and in Galatians 5 and in other passages in the New Testament, all speak about the outworking of the Spirit of God in the lives of those who follow Jesus. To not only help Christians, but to also um, help us in our communities where Jesus sends us as his representatives to help others to live life well as well. We are committed to being transformed by the Spirit of God as we follow Jesus. It was interesting to read this week that the Global Wellness Institute predicts that the wellness economy will grow from $4.4 trillion in 2020 
to almost $7 trillion in 2025. The top three areas where people spend money are in personal care and beauty, $955 billion. Health, eating and nutrition and weight loss, $946 billion. Physical activity, $738 billion. And this is an American website, so you can do the math as converting that into Australian dollars. People across the world are investing trillions of dollars into transforming their lives to live their lives better in a little bit in some small way. But the reality is that you could spend double that. You could spend even triple that without making a dent in helping people to be better, to do better. Sure, they may weigh less when they gossip and slander someone. Sure, they may look prettier and more sculpted as they pursue an affair. And without a doubt, they can eat healthier as they steal from their employer. You can gain the whole world of wellness and still lose your souls. In Jesus' day, he called those that identified with God but were devoid of God inside, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Looking good on the outside, but in Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28, he says, you're hopeless. You religion, uh, you're, you religion, religion scholars and Pharisees, you're frauds. You are like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotten bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. The transformation that we believe following Jesus leads us into starts from the inside and works its way out. As Ezekiel 37 gives us the dramatic in, in, imagery of a pile of dry bones being transformed back to life. Some 6,000 years later, Jesus, as recorded in Matthew 5, uh, 15, 10 and 11, and then later in verses 17 to 20, he says this, Then Jesus called the crowd to come here and listen. He said, and try, listen and try and understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. And then later on when he's talking to his disciples, he says, anything you eat passes through your stomach and then goes into the sewer. But the words you speak come from your heart. That's what defiles you. For from your heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, or sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Now, kids, this is not an excuse not to wash up before dinner, okay? Jesus is not talking about that. But he is talking about the fact that it's what is on the inside that emerges out. And what's inside is what is truly whether we are following God or not. Transformation by the Spirit of God comes from the inside out. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we read this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the, the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Does this mean our bodies don't matter? Well, actually, the Bible teaches us the opposite. The way we look after ourselves and the way we try to live life well through healthier choices that we make is a witness to the world that we want to honour God 
um, who created us in his image. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, Paul writes, Don't you realise that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honour God with your body. But if we forget about the internal transformation, then we are no better than the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day. We, we are committed to being transformed from the inside out by the Spirit of God who lives in us as we seek to follow Jesus, the person. The final thing to note in this commitment is the very first word, we. We. This is not something that just you or I do, but it's a commitment that we make together. We are the body of Christ. And while we all must give an individual account to God for the decisions that we make as individuals, the idea that as a Christian, that, um, that we are a follower of Jesus in isolation is a foreign concept in the word of God. While there might be limited circumstances when following Jesus um, means that we have to pursue a relationship with God um, in isolation and we do so reluctantly because of ill health, because of um, persecution, because of a restriction around what we can do, it is absolute bunkum that God wants us to follow Jesus outside of a community of faith. If you believe that, then you believe a lie. Throughout the Bible, it speaks time and time again of being added to the community, the we. In Hebrews 12, it speaks of being a part of a cloud of witnesses. And a few chapters earlier, the writer in Hebrews chapter 10 calls us to hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect the meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. So you're, if you're not intentionally joining with other followers of Jesus to invest in a relationship with God, and others, then I want you to, t to challenge you today to stop making excuses. Because not only are you stunting your own relationship with God, but you're also withholding your ability to be a blessing to others as well. At Northern, as a group of Christians, we want to live life well. And we today affirm that we are committed to being transformed, not just once, but an ongoing transformation that continues throughout our life as we follow the lifelong disciplines by the Spirit of God, the Spirit who lives in us and empowers us and equips us and guides us as we seek to discern and live out what it means to be a follower of Jesus in a world in which Jesus sends us to be his representatives, to help others to discover what it means to truly live life well. Let me pray. Jesus, as we ponder over these words, as we reflect upon what it means to live life well as we seek to follow you, Lord, would you quicken in us a hunger, a desire to pursue a deeper, richer, broader, uh, greater relationship with you. Thank you that we don't just follow a Bible, but we follow you, the living word. That we just don't follow a group of creeds and doctrines and those sorts of things, but we follow a saviour who died on the cross for us rose again, lives victorious, and wants us to live that victorious life as well. 
Jesus, we thank you that you call us, regardless of our age or our circumstances, you call us to follow you into this world to be your representatives, to help others to know what it means to live life well as we seek to follow you. Continue to do your good work in us and through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we respond today? Well, out of what we've heard, what resonates most with you today? Out of that um, statement that we are committed to being transformed by the Spirit of God as we follow Jesus, what one of those words resonates most with you today? What can we do to help encourage and motivate you in your following of Jesus? And then lastly, how might you be an example to others that following Jesus is the most important part of your life? If you are not a follower of Jesus, if you would like to know more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, then I would love to have a chat with you about that as well. So music is going to be played. And as it is, I encourage you to take out those response cards or use the chat at home and to respond to the things that God's saying to you today. God bless you.